people to deliver me. Number 35. back your seats. Let's try that third verse together. That's number 500 once again. On that third, let us leave upon the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk about his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and the work of earth is done, and the Lord is full of yonder I'll be there. Oh, 
your name will be called uh, when we step into glory and uh, meet, Jesus, meet Jesus face to face. We're seeing that song. It reminded me of uh, Lambert's. I don't know if you've heard of Lambert's. It's, uh, it's a restaurant down south, home of the thrown roll. Uh, so you've got to be careful. So when the roll is called at Lambert's, you better be ducking because it could hit you in the head. So I remember we'd gone over there at college. We'd had gotten a pass and gone over there, a couple of us guys. And uh, a friend uh, came with us, couldn't catch real good, but man, he thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But so we waited until the waitress was on the other side of the restaurant, and they're yelling, hot rolls, hot rolls, and he lifts his hand right here. And the waitress just fired one in there. He missed it, blew up everything on the table. I mean, drinks going everywhere, but we had a great time with it. But we said, no more rolls for you, buddy. We'll do the rest of you. But uh, anyway, uh, the, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Uh, what a tremendous truth that is. Let's go out for prayer, uh, and then we'll continue singing one more song, and then we'll get into our message for tonight. Jerry, would you open our service in prayer, please? Let's turn over to 158. 158. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hymn number 58. textbooks out here tonight and uh, thank you Ruth for playing for us this evening and uh, all the services that you play for us thank you so much for that uh, let's go ahead we're going to be in Genesis chapter number one Genesis chapter number one to begin uh, and in your notes does anybody have the page number right there still 96 all right number 96 the lesson number six the sanctity of life. The sanctity of life. Now, I think this, we'll, uh, we'll look at the scriptures in just a moment, but I think that we are probably, uh, for the most part, on the same page, all of us in this room, in regards to uh, the value of life, the sanctity of life. And uh, uh, praise the Lord for that. That can't be said uh, uh, in uh, probably many churches of that, but uh, we believe uh, based upon the word of God, uh, that uh, life begins at conception and life is valuable to God and God has purpose for every life that 
that he creates. And uh, we're going to be, uh, tonight you might say, well, we kind of already know all of that. What's the, what's the big deal? Why, why are we devoting a whole Wednesday to it? And, and here's kind of the reason why, or a couple, couple reasons. First of all, uh, you might know somebody that maybe this is a struggle for them in regards to their belief systems, uh, and they're not exactly confident and sure when does life begin, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So we want to, we want to, if we can, if we can say this, arm you uh, with scripture to show, so that you can be able to show individuals, hey, here's what the Bible says about life. And once again, uh, this is going back to that which we have been studying, our, our biblical worldview. And so for us, where do we go back to? We go back to the scriptures. Uh, and that's, that's where we uh, determine our belief systems based upon uh, the word of God. I saw an individual uh, uh, said this, I think maybe Monday I saw this, and uh, they said, hey, I've got a friend uh, who, and I don't remember the issue right off the top of my head, but is there anything that I can tell them, other show them other than the Bible uh, about this issue that they were talking about? Uh, and... Uh, People just kind of try to help them out and says, hey, no, the, the Bible is where we get our standard for our faith practice. Our convictions are rooted in the truth of God's word. And, and to separate our beliefs from the truth of God's word is foolish. Uh, you begin to separate your beliefs from the word of God, and you can go down the street and go to another church. They've already done that. Okay? And, and other religions have already done that. And peoples have already done that. Uh, they like the product, but they don't necessarily like it. Uh, the word of God. And so, let's look. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. We consider the sanctity of life. I want to kind of arm you with just some thoughts tonight uh, as you may uh, uh, come across individuals that, hey, don't, uh, don't know, don't understand, and don't understand the reason why. So we want to give you those tonight. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in his own image. I'm sorry, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, uh, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them. God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so, this idea of, or not the ideal, but the practice really of abortion, uh, and we could even say that different times and spots in people's lives, uh, really our world is looking to, to define the value of life as uh, kind of based upon what they can contribute to society. Uh, and we're, you know, when you begin with abortion, it's, just, it's a very slippery slope. Where, does, where do you determine the value of somebody's life and what they're contributing to society? At what age are we not contributing anymore? Uh, at what uh, may be deformity or mental illness uh, does, does somebody get to where yep, they're no longer deemed useful for society? So it's a very slippery slope, this valuing of life. And we're going to look specifically uh, at uh, and abortion and conception and all of that. So let's pray. Uh, we'll ask the Lord to help us uh, tonight as we try to tackle this subject matter. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather tonight uh, to look into your word. God, I think for the most part, we are probably uh, all on the same page in this room, on the same page probably in regards to the sanctity of life. But God, I pray that you'd help us as we look at scripture tonight. And uh, God, help us to... Uh, we, we read in your word, iron sharpen and iron. God, may, may we sharpen really our, our sword. God, give us some um, uh, understanding uh, about this subject matter uh, so that we can faithfully speak the truth to love or in love uh, to a world that needs to know the truth about life. God bless us now. Uh, we love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple questions to think about as we get started. First of all. Uh, and this is a question in our society today, one that is, is debated uh, on the floors of Congress, is debated in medical uh, universities, all of that. When does life begin? When does life begin? Uh, and that's a question that, that's asked uh, uh, on the talk shows and all of that as they try to figure out this, this right to life, or right to choice, 
participate in the questions always asked when does life begin but we're going to try to we're going to look at the scriptures and uh, and uh, tell you when life begins based upon the scriptures and then secondly and i've kind of already mentioned this but another question we want to answer tonight is how valuable is a single life how valuable uh, is a single life and that's a legitimate question uh, we know that in uh, European Union countries and in that area uh, they actually have boards and, and that where they will determine uh, if that if a person's life is deemed worth saving uh, and uh, if, if somebody has an, an illness or a disease of some sorts or a, a, a deformity uh, they will they'll have to submit and, and, and appear for this council they'll determine whether or not they get treatment uh, in some cases and, and, it, and it's kind of a sad thing and so they're really determining whether or not an individual's life is valuable or not and we know this and, and I, I don't want to answer the question just now we know that value life is valuable uh, but as we as we look at that question God has created each one of us with a definite purpose uh, and a plan and if you go into the into the many scriptures in the New Testament I'll just John 3 16 for God so loved who the world. the world and the world includes everybody God loves everybody so everybody's created with purpose and with God's love and love uh, and so we've got to keep that uh, ever before us as we consider the value of a single life uh, the last question that we're going to seek to answer tonight is does the value of a life change if that life inconveniences someone else's life does the value of a life change if that life inconveniences someone else's life years ago i read this uh, madonna had an abortion i don't know if you know who madonna is and the reason for that abortion is because she said that that baby inside her was attacking her body uh, and it was changing her body uh, in a way that she did not want to change it, so she had an abortion. Uh, and uh, at what point uh, does the value of life change if that life inconveniences someone else's life? Uh, and we'll look to answer that uh, here this evening. Now, let me give you uh, kind of a, another introduction, uh, continue that introduction beyond those questions. Uh, but I want to give you really uh, a definition, a worldview uh, definition, okay? And I want you to think about this as we walk through our lesson tonight. The framework of ideas and beliefs, our worldview, is the framework of ideas and beliefs through which an individual or group interprets and interacts with the world, okay? And so the window frame, uh, uh, the framework of ideas and beliefs through which an individual or group interprets and interacts with the world. Think about this, your windshield. Your windshield, if you don't ever clean that, does it change your perspective? It sure does. Uh, and uh, you know, you gotta have that clean so that you, you can see clearly all of that. Uh, your windows at the house, you clean them, uh, and it changes your perspective uh, on the things. And so uh, we're talking about this, this definition for us, okay? Uh, and I wanted to kind of give you this, uh, this picture, okay? This is a window, all right? Uh, now, uh, the window frame uh, in this picture doesn't move, right? The window frame stays there. Do the things uh, outside the window change? Sure they do. With the seasons, right? It might snow. Uh, you're going to see snow falling down and gathering other branches on the ground, all that kind of stuff. In the fall, uh, you know, if, if you're living in a, in a place where this happens, uh, the colors of the leaves begin to change all the time. So, so the scenery outside the window is constantly changing. But the window frame stays there. And so the window frame does not move. It provides, and here it is, it's significant, it provides a consistent vantage point for the viewer. So the window does. Think about that now in regards to your worldview. When you have a biblical worldview, uh, you have a consistent vantage point to view the world. Is the world changing? Has it changed? Think back. Has the world changed since you were a kid? Okay. <laughs> In the last, what, 10 years, I'd say the world's changed dramatically in regards to some of these issues that, that we've mentioned here in recent weeks we'll continue to talk about. But has the Bible changed? No. 
And so that biblical worldview, hey, it keeps you, keeps you centered. Uh, and you have that, that view of the world through that biblical lens. That doesn't change. The world changes. Now think about our world. Our world changes. The philosophies of this world change. You look into politics. I'll give you one example that this just kind of popped into my head. Our president, President Joe Biden, several years ago uh, had said this. He had said uh, that they, there should not be gay marriage. And then he totally flip-flopped, and now he's all for gay marriage. Because that's really what the culture, the society was calling for. And so, hey, we, he doesn't have a biblical worldview. And so, hey, as the world changes, so do his beliefs change. Well, we're not sure about if his beliefs change or the people that are controlling him change his beliefs. I don't know. But that's, that's all for another debate. You can do all of that. So that's just one example. Uh, and uh, people's viewpoints, uh, if they're not rooted in the Word of God, they change. Uh, and so here's a, just a couple of uh, uh, thoughts of things to remember as we approach this topic of the sanctity of life here. And I don't know if they've got, got these in your notes, but I want to give you just kind of kind of two really quick thoughts. That they're not going to be on the screen there. But number one, as we consider this topic of the sanctity of life, remember this. First of all, number one, remember that truth matters. Remember that truth matters. Uh, and we've mentioned this, that uh, truth in our world is, is changing, you know, the definition of it is changing. It's not, it's not truth anymore, it's, it's your truth, and we've talked about that. Uh, but remember that truth matters. Uh, how you uh, and I feel is irrelevant to the reality of life. Okay, how you and I feel is irrelevant to the reality of life. What do we know about feelings? change, okay? Uh, we were just talking about feeling tired. You know, we're, we're adults, you know, and the, the energy isn't there maybe as much as, well, it doesn't help you're up at two in the morning, but, uh, you know, we're, we're tired. Uh, and man, uh, we're changing, and so uh, the truth, it doesn't matter what we, what we think about the truth, what we feel about the truth, the truth is the truth, whether we believe it or not. Okay? Uh, secondly, uh, we need to, as we consider our biblical worldview, uh, what is, what our view is this, we need to remember that, uh, what is true according to the Bible. So the Bible doesn't change. Okay, we know in our world today, people change, conversations change, beliefs change, and all of that. And then, uh, uh, one more, one more thought here, remember that truth matters, and then also remember this, and I think this is very important for us today, remember that tone matters. Tone. It matters. Uh, Mom and dad, you probably speak to this. Your tone as you address your child matters. But let's do this. Husband, wife. The tone in which something is said almost speaks louder than what is said sometimes, right? The, uh, you ask them maybe your wife something, and they just like, yeah, I love him. Okay? Oh, thank you. Or you say something, say, yeah, go ahead. Tone matters. The second, yeah, go ahead. She might be saying, yeah, go ahead. But in her tone, saying, you better not. <laughs> tone matters. And the same is true when we communicate the word of God. Our tone matters. Uh, we're to speak the truth how? We're to speak it in what? Love. Ephesians 4, 15. So let's speak the truth in love. They grow up into him in, in, uh, in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So as we consider this subject matter, we're to speak the truth in love. Uh, and just uh, one, one more thought here. Uh, think about this now. As we consider this topic, God's grace, God's grace is, is so deep. It can't be measured. I love the song, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Uh, I love those songs speaking about God's grace. God's grace is deep, and his forgiveness, okay, is greater than any guilt we may experience. So I, I don't know, uh, it's not some backstory here, maybe uh, abortion has been in your past and those types of things. Just know that, hey, hey, our God's a forgiving God, and his forgiveness is greater than the guilt of our mistakes of the past, okay? Uh, and, uh, uh, and he's offering to Give forgiveness, okay? Now, let me share with you three quick thoughts tonight. Well, I shouldn't say quick. Let me give you three thoughts tonight about the truth in regards to human life, okay? 
Uh, we were, number one, formed in God's image. This we saw back in our passage here, uh, that we were created by God, by God and in uh, his image. Back in verse number 27, so God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. This is the, uh, as we consider life, being created in his image, this is the first and, and most important truth uh, the Bible teaches us about life, the fact that we have been created in God's image. Uh, and uh, sometimes in our lives, sometimes when we think about being created in the image of God, uh, we focus a lot on maybe the physical aspects, the physical appearance maybe, uh, as we think about being formed in, uh, in the image of God. But, you know, our God, he's a spirit, our God does not have a body, and so uh, we're talking about the, uh, a lot of the, the qualities and characteristics of God that uh, we've been created uh, in his image in that way. Uh, John 4, 27, God's a spirit, and they that worship him, worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let me share with you, uh, as we consider being formed in God's image, but A, human life has sacred value. <coughs> human life has sacred value. We look at verse number 28, after he created the male and female, created he them, verse 27, and God blessed them. Uh, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, we find the spirit. So we see that God blesses them. Uh, we, are, we are spiritual beings. Uh, and uh, with each one of us with a living soul. If you look at chapter 2 and verse number 7, this might be uh, in your notes, I, I think. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Uh, the psalmist, when we read the Psalms, uh, when he referred to the soul as, uh, he said this, that all that is in me, in Psalm 103, verse 1, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, uh, bless his holy name. And so uh, uh, the psalmist has said, Hey, everything that I have, my soul, uh, is to bless his holy name. Uh, human life. As we, as we said, you know, life has sacred value. It's sacred because it originates from God. Okay? It originates from God. When we don't view life through that window, that biblical perspective, uh, and we view life as, as just a clump of cells, uh, as just a, a blob of matter, uh, then, then it really doesn't, let's put it this way, then it really doesn't matter uh, what we do with, with our life. Uh, but when, when we say and know from the scriptures that, hey, we were created by God, that changes, that changes everything because our life originated from God. Job 33, verse number 4, the Spirit of God hath made me, uh, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Psalm 36, verse number 9, for with thee is the fountain of life, and thy light shall we see light. Uh, and so God, our human life has saved value because it's been given by God. Letter B. Human life has a specific beginning. Human life has a specific beginning. Okay? Uh, and, and let me give you just a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, scriptures. Psalm 139. Uh, I believe you have it right there. Uh, verse 13 and 14. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Jeremiah 1.5, a verse that we often go to, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, uh, the scriptures say. In fact, you go to Exodus, uh, and the law stated, uh, say this, and do you have Exodus 21 right there? Okay, yeah, look at this. If men strive and hurt a woman with a child, so that her fruit depart from her, so that her child, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. And uh, we read also in the scriptures that they were, uh, and, and this is even in our world today, uh, if uh, a, a, a lady is, is hurt, is killed, and the baby that she is carrying is killed, uh, and, and, and all of that, uh, they're liable for, and they're responsible for the murder of two individuals. Uh, but uh, that's, I don't, you can kind of see how crazy that is. If you damage a baby in the womb, uh, kill a baby that's in the womb, uh, 
and, and then dies, but you go to the doctor's office or go to the Planned Parenthood and you can get an abortion where they can rip that baby right from the mother, it's okay. So, so we see kind of the double standard uh, in regards to that. We see double standards in our society all over the place. Uh, we know this, in Luke chapter 1, verse number 41, that the Bible refers to John uh, as a baby, refers to him as a person. It came to pass, and when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, the scriptures, they make no distinction between the born uh, and the unborn. Luke 2, verse number 12, and this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So, uh, the, the babe, born or unborn. It's crazy in our world today that if you were to damage like some eagle eggs, uh, you're talking a hefty fine, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and I'm not saying, hey, let's go do that. But is human life more valuable than a bird's life? That's something to consider and think about. Uh, and uh, we would say, yes, it is, but that's not the way our world views it. Uh, and uh, so, uh, just, it's just crazy to think about. So human life has that specific beginning. Uh, human life also, uh, as we noted to already tonight, has special purpose. Hey, God formed you. Isaiah 43 and verse number 7, uh, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Uh, and so God has formed us. God has made us. Uh, I don't know. Anybody build anything, construct anything, create anything? Not create, I guess we can't create, but okay, many of us have done that, okay? Uh, now, do we build whatever it is that you build? Do you build it for a purpose? Okay? If you're going to build a shed, it's probably, it's probably because you got too much junk, okay? Let's be honest. Uh, I, I got two sheds, they're full of stuff, and I don't even ever get out of there. Uh, so why, why did I have the stuff? But anyway, uh, we might build things for a definite purpose. Now, in our society today, we can also go down to Walmart and purchase things. So we might not have to build some things, but we can go down to Walmart or whatever it is, wherever it is that you like to shop, and you buy something. Why do you buy something? Because you need it for a specific purpose, typically. And uh, uh, God has formed us, God has created us for purpose. Uh, and and, it, and uh, that every life has a purpose. Now, let me share with you uh, number two tonight. Uh, we've been we were formed by God. Mankind is formed in God's image. Uh, but number two, we we know this that we are fallen in our sin. We are fallen in our sin. In Genesis chapter three. In verse number three, we read of the fall. The Bible says, but the fruit of the trees. Let's, let's go to verse number two. Uh, while one and two, Satan and Eve are having this discussion about the fruit and uh, partaking. Uh, and uh, uh, the, Eve says this, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, thou hast said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Uh, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The eyes of them both were open, they knew uh, that they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves uh, aprons. And so we see this fall of man. And so as we consider this, you know, we are sinners as well. Uh, what does the fall, the falling of into sin, mean to the value of human life? Okay, what does that, what does it mean uh, for us today in regards to the fall? We know this as believers. We know this uh, that number one, the damage done at the fall, the damage of sin is great. Okay, uh, the damage of sin is great. Romans five, verse number twelve. Wherefore, if by one man sin entered into the world, look what happens. Because sin entered into the world, what happened? And now, death by sin. The damage is great. The results and consequences of sin are horrible. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have, <coughs> excuse me, all have sinned. 
Uh, and so uh, the damage done by the fall uh, is, is kind of irreversible damage, uh, and we live in this sin-cursed world. But I want you to know this. Just because the damage has been great, it does not mean uh, that the value of life has changed. The value of life remains protected. The Sixth Commandment tells us, Thou shalt not kill. Uh, and it prohibits murder. Genesis 9 and verse number 6 says, Whoso sheddeth a man's blood, uh, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And so why do, why do we not kill? Why do we not murder? Because we've been created in the image of God. Genesis 9 and verse number 6. And so, uh, I want to uh, kind of pose this question to you, this question uh, right here. Uh, so what if abortion, so what if abortion ends life? Okay, and this was a question uh, that Salon Magazine was asked uh, of, of a lady. Uh, and I want to kind of share a little bit of this article with you in Salon, uh, in Salon Magazine where Mary Elizabeth Williams, she wrote this piece entitled, So What If Abortion Ends Life? Okay, she's not asking the question, it's kind of, a, a, well, who cares? Well, who cares if abortion uh, ends life? Uh, and uh, the article, Williams presents uh, what used to be a pro-life argument that the baby in the womb has personhood, but concludes that the baby's life is more expendable than the mother's life, and for that, for that reason should not legally protect, be protected. And here's what she says. She says, I believe that life starts at conception. Okay? That's an honest statement by this woman here. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Mary Elizabeth Williams says, I believe that life starts at, con at conception. And it's never stopped me from being pro-choice. Okay? She believes life begins at conception, but she's still pro-choice. Uh, and she continues, I know that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life. And that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. I have friends who have referred to their abortions in terms of scraping out a bunch of cells. And then a few years later, we uh, were exalted over the pregnancies that they unhesitantly described in terms of the baby and this kid. She says, I know women who have been relieved at their abortions and grieved uh, over their miscarriages. Why can't we agree that it's pretty silly to pretend that what was growing inside of them wasn't the same? When we try to act like a pregnancy doesn't evolve to human life, we wind up drawing stupid semantic lines in the sand. First trimester abortion versus second trimester versus late term. Uh, just dancing around the issue, trying to decide if there's a single magic moment when a fetus becomes a person. Are you human only when you are born? Only when you're viable outside of the womb? Are you less of a human life when you look like a tadpole than when you can uh, suck on your own thumb? Uh, if by random fluke I learned today I was pregnant, you bet I'd have an abortion. I'd have the world's greatest abortion. My conviction is that the fetus is indeed a life, a life worth sacrificing. And, and she's pro-choice, but believes that the baby growing inside of her is a life, and yet uh, that life can be terminated uh, whenever. Uh, and it has, I mean, you look at just kind of the, the, the sickness, the, the double standard, is it life, is it not life? She says it's life and still says, hey, abortion's okay. And so really the battle here uh, in our society really does not hinge on whether life begins at conception or not. It's not what the world is concerned about. Uh, if they're concerned, they, they just worry about, and here, here's what it is, it's, all, it's mainly pride. Uh, it's mainly, hey, it's my body, it's my choice, uh, and uh, I'm gonna do what I want with my body. And that's, that's how, how sad uh, that is. Uh, science, as we consider, consider life at conception and uh, what that woman just said, science uh, uh, can provide can provide facts, okay? We just heard first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. We also know terms like partial birth abortion, 
uh, and those types of, uh, of, of just horrible things. And science, uh, for us, uh, provides facts, but it cannot provide meaning. Okay, and this woman who wrote this, hey, it's a life, but I can do with that life what I want because it's my body, it's my choice. Science shows, and uh, uh, very evident, that human life begins at conception. Uh, we mentioned just a moment ago, if you were to go destroy some eagle eggs, okay, at what point did those eagle eggs become eagles? Okay, They're, are they just eggs or not? Are they called the cells or are they not? Okay, and so we value that kind of life, but not, but not human life. Uh, the question can be asked, how do we get to the point as a society that we see life as expendable? Okay, John 3, verse number 19, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Uh, and that's the world we live in. Uh, you think about it, the human heart without Christ. Okay? Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? The human heart without Christ is depraved and we're going to make self-centered choices because we're consumed with self. And so we make those selfish choices. The issue of the sanctity of life, get this now, the issue of the sanctity of life is a spiritual issue, not a political one. But in our world today, in our country today, this is being made into a political issue. Uh, and where do we stand uh, online? I like what, the, what President Reagan said. He says, it's, it's amazing to me that all of the people that are for abortion are alive. You know, I, if you were to bring back some of those, bring some of those babies here, that uh, and, uh, I'm sure that they would have loved life uh, in their day before life. So the sanctity of life is, is a spiritual issue, not a political one. Romans 1, verse number 25. Uh, we were here several, uh, probably two months ago, uh, in this passage, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And that's what our world has done. They changed the truth of God into a lie. And the sanctity of life into now this gender that we are, are going through right now in our world today, into marriage, the redefining of marriage, and the list goes on. The demasculinization of men, uh, calling it toxic masculinity. Uh, and all of those things are an attack upon God and his creation. We know this, that the devaluing of life began after the fall. Uh, what happened in the early chapters of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 4, verse number 8, we see where life has already been devalued. Uh, it says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, and they were revealed that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Cain, because he was embarrassed, ashamed, uh, he shown up, what he considers shown up by his brother, not recognized by God, and anger kills his brother. And so he values himself, his pride, over his brother's life. And, and his brother's life, the value was not there. Uh, the truth of God in our world today has been exchanged for a lie. A couple of, uh, uh, just uh, uh, some, a couple of statistics for you. 22% of pregnancies in America today end in abortion. 22%. That means 78% of pregnancies uh, might go to full term. There might be miscarriages you know, and those types of things. But 22% end in abortions. The United States of America, and this is so sad, aborts about 1.3 million babies a year. That is, and get this now, that is as many abortions every year as the number of Americans who were killed in the Revolutionary War Civil War, World War One and II, the Korean War, Vietnam War, the Persian Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan, all combined. We kill that many just Americans every year that have died in all of the wars that we've been involved in. That's a staggering statistic to think about. 1.3 million people. Uh, just incredible. Romans 1, 29 and 32 uh, state this, being filled with all righteousness, for murder, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And we've seen this in the news, 
Uh, and uh, I heard about these things. Let me give you another thought here. Uh, the book that, that, that has been written, Shall Hear Abortion, uh, being, being proud of it. Uh, and uh, the Shout Your Abortion Network has created a presence on social media by using Shout Your Abortion and posting testimonies of women who have had abortions and are glad they did. The lack of shame or sadness for taking human life is indicative of fallen culture, moving away from God and decency. Several years ago, I don't watch the show, but I believe it's called Grey's Anatomy. Never seen the show. The final show in, a, in, in one of the seasons uh, had a woman on the on the doctor's table getting an abortion while they're playing in the background the song Silent Night. And that's how that season ended their program uh, with, with the lady getting abortion Silent Night and that, that abortion being celebrated. You're, you're familiar with, with this next individual here, Governor Andrew Cuomo. Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, said, uh, said this, he said, I am directing the New York landmarks to live in pink to celebrate this achievement. What is the achievement? The pro-choice uh, abortion achievement. Uh, he's celebrating, you might remember this, in 2019, they passed the Reproductive Health Act, a bill that expanded abortion rights and decriminalized, decriminalized the practice. Supporters were chanting, free abortion on demand, we can do it, yes we can, uh, was, was their chant. Uh, and uh, similar to, uh, if you read in the scriptures, even the children of Israel, the, or the Canaanites there, as they worshiped the god Moloch, uh, and, uh, and uh, they would sacrifice their children on the altars to their gods. Uh, and then Andrew, Andrew Cuomo celebrating this passage of, of the, the uh, health the Reproductive Health Act. Now, what we've also had in recent years, too, uh, the Supreme Court has has struck down Roe versus Wade. Okay? Um, and we've had, there's been a lot of backlash about that. Okay? The, all that did was turn the power to the states to determine what each state wants to do with abortion. Uh, it did not strike down abortion, just as the federal government cannot cannot mandate this or approve this. This is a state issue. And so uh, we, we rejoice in that what the Supreme Court decided, and we're thankful for that, but the battle is far from over. There's 50 states where now that battle is going on, and we praise the Lord for uh, for progress made in different states and the legislatures in the passing of pro-life bills. We're not there yet. Uh, we, I, I praise the Lord for heartbeat bills. But life begins before there's a heartbeat in that womb, if it begins at conception. So I thank the Lord for the progress made, uh, and we praise you for that, but there's still a lot of work uh, to do uh, uh, in that. And just because, and you know, just a, another quick thought here, uh, I have a, an article here by a guy named uh, Herbert Gosnell. Uh, he's uh, from the Radi uh, Radiance Foundation. Uh, he's an abortion activist, doctor, uh, who has botched many abortions and saved the remains of aborted babies. And, and uh, Ryan uh, Baumgartner uh, said this, he says, abortion activists, they worship abortion. It is, a, it is sacred to them. Nothing on earth, according to the faithful, uh, should ever desecrate the holy ground upon which the ritual is performed over a thousand times a day. Even if that ground is soaked with the blood of women killed and maimed and babies brutally murdered after being born alive. Uh, and that, that just a sick description uh, of this doctor as he uh, took pleasure in, in abortions and obviously many moms were, were hurt uh, uh, in that process there. Now think about this. Just because something, and, and, and abortion is celebrated, but just because something is, is common, does that, does that make it right? No. Just because everybody else is doing it, you heard this, just because everybody else is doing it, does that mean that we should be doing it? No. Uh, and even though abortion is celebrated in our society today, uh, it, is, it is not right. Now, let me give you this. 
Uh, number three, the responses to the issue of issues of life. The thought as we consider this, okay, abortion is, is not something new and relevant just to our world today, okay, in the last uh, 60, 70 years. It's not anything new. Uh, abortion has been, has been practiced uh, uh, throughout time. Uh, so we got to understand this isn't just something that's brand new. It's, it's plagued our world for thousands of years. Uh, so how do we respond to this? Okay, First of all, we're to respond with clarity. Respond with clarity. Uh, Satan, he brings confusion where there is clarity. Okay, uh, who, who would have thought uh, that we wouldn't know what bathroom to use? Okay, who, who would have thought that? An issue that's so clear, male and female. Uh, and, uh, and there's confusion there now. Marriage between a man and a woman has been redefined. Now that there's confusion. We've got kids now that have two mommies and two daddies. I was, I was talking to a couple this week. Uh, and uh, so I was in the restaurant, I was talking with them, and uh, they were signing their kids up for something, and uh, the kids, they had to identify how they, uh, how they were connected with the child. Well, mom and a mom, uh, dad and a dad, uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and, uh, and they said on this sheet of paper there was nothing, uh, there was no place for them to mark that they were a dad, a legitimate dad, legitimate mom, male dad, female mom. There was nothing like that on the paper. And so they had to call in and say, hey, there's, what are we supposed to do here? We're doing things the way that, that God has planned it, the right way, and there's no, no place for us to check off. Everything else is being glorified and uh, celebrated, uh, and, and proper parenthood is not. In that same, uh, in that same Salon article uh, that, we, that we read from earlier, Mary, Mary Elizabeth Williams, she said this, in the midst of this unique movement, Planned Parenthood has taken the bold step of reframing the vernacular, uh, moving away from the easy and easily divisive words like life and choice. Instead, a new pr promotional uh, film acknowledges it's not, it's not a black and white issue. It's not that there's no clear, uh, clear way to go on this, so it's not pro-life, it's not pro-choice, and so we see this, this confusion being made. Uh, three words, oh, no, I don't have them there, uh, but three words just really quick uh, that, that are often referred to by the, the pro-life or pro-choice crowd. Viability. Is, uh, is there any of this in your notes here? Is viability? Is that in there? Okay. So let me give you these three words. Viability, what do they say? It's the point at which a baby is potentially able to live outside the mother's womb. Uh, and, and that's what's going on. Well, it's the viability of the child. Can it survive on its own? Okay, so that's where some people draw the line, viability. Uh, the question can be, can be asked then, but what about those who have been seriously injured, like in a car accident, and people like that, uh, and require machines to keep them alive while their bodies heal? Are they still viable? Uh, if machines are keeping them alive. So that's, that's a, a, a problem with the viability argument. Uh, uh, number two, uh, cognizance. Cognizance, the ability to understand and to know what's going on. Okay? Uh, the point, that's the point at which the baby is aware of its surroundings. I can tell you this, I've got kids still that are not aware of their surroundings. Uh, and they're in their double digits and in their teenage years. They're, doing they're still not aware. Okay? It's so cognizance. Uh, and so the question is, what about those that are in a coma? They're not cognizant, okay? Uh, or, or in a physical state in which they are not cognizant of uh, uh, mental deformities and so on. And then this question, so we got viability, cognizance, and then heartbeat, that's another one uh, that is often referred to. Uh, and you know what, hey, if there's a heartbeat, hey, then that is why. Uh, the, the challenge is this, the moment of a heartbeat is seen as the start of life by the pro-choice crowd, but what about those who have a pacemaker? Is their life not valuable now because they've got a machine that is keeping their heart going? Or whose heart will not, or, or somebody whose heart will not beat without intervention? And so uh, there's a lot of this gray 
questioning. Hey, what is it? I don't know. Liability? God is it? I don't know. Here's the, here's the answer. The clearest line that can be drawn, the clearest demarcation of life's beginning is not heart faith, not cognizance, uh, not liability, but rather it's at conception. It's at conception. Uh, and that's a very clear line uh, that can be drawn and can be, can be followed, okay? Uh, scriptures even states this. It says uh, Psalm 51, verse number 5, Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my, my mother conceive me. Conception. Uh, and then having to have a life at, at conception. Scientific evidence agrees. Look at, I don't want you to be able to read this, uh, but look at the, uh, the scientific evidence, okay? This is the uh, first, uh, uh, the beginnings of the conceived baby uh, going through the nine months. So January 1st, so just taking the date, January 1st, being conception day. Uh, on the very day of conception, all 46 chromosomes are present. So human life has already begun. This is a unique human being with a unique genetic data who can never be for, uh, reproduced or replaced. So that moment of conception, they already have uh, the makeup of who they are uh, biologically. Uh, January 27th, so only about three weeks after conception, the child's heart begins to beat, uh, pumping her own blood, okay? Uh, and so that's just three weeks after conception. Uh, we know this February 4th is about the fifth week, which is around the time many mothers confirm that they are pregnant, the child's eyes, legs, and hands begin to develop. Uh, in February 14th, by Valentine's Day, which is barely the sixth week after conception, the child's brain waves, which have already been active for some time, are now detectable. So we see how quick all of this, all of this happens. Uh, by late February, towards the end of February, only the seventh week from conception, the babies are kicking and swimming. Just under two months into pregnancy, every organ in the child's body is in place, the bones are taking shape, and fingerprints have already begun to form. Mid-March, so just a couple weeks later, teeth begin to form, fingernails develop. The baby can turn her head, and she can even frown. Let's just hope they don't frown all the time. By late March, the baby can grasp objects placed in her hand. By late April, the baby can start having dreams uh, during REM sleep. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so we see how, uh, how quick all of that goes, goes along here. Uh, and, and we create all these gray areas. Uh, well, it's the heartbeat. Well, that's three weeks ago. It's cognizance. It's viability. Just looking for every excuse uh, to, uh, to abort a baby. Uh, and so, scientific evidence agrees that life begins at conception. Uh, I'll say this, the human conscience agrees, okay? 84% uh, of mothers, 84% of mothers will decide not to have an abortion after seeing an ultrasound. Why? Because their conscience, it's their baby, they see life. And 84% of mothers uh, uh, will not go through with an abortion after seeing an ultrasound. Uh, let me give you this too. Uh, this uh, saved the storks, okay? Uh, the story that was written uh, by, by a pro-life group called Save the Storks here. Uh, and you can see the three words of it, love, compassion, and action. I wanted to kind of just share this, uh, this description uh, with you. At 21 years old, uh, she found herself pregnant with her mind that set on abortion. But in order to obtain an abortion, she had to get an ultrasound. She saw that her local pregnancy resource center was offering free ultrasounds, so she went to their office. She would had an abortion several years ago and felt that abortion was her best option to get. She told the client advocate that she still wanted to live life and wasn't ready financially for a child. They spoke for a long time discussing her options, what she wanted to do, and whether or not she had support from anyone in her life. Uh, no one did this with me when I, when I had my abortion before, Amy said. I never saw that ultrasound or even knew how far along I was. They just told me I was early. After meeting with a certain uh, staff, Amy started her ultrasound. As soon as she could see the screen, uh, she sat up on the exam examination table and said, That's a life. I can't believe at seven weeks a baby would have a heartbeat 
Uh, she stared in amazement at the ultrasound images on the screen saying, this changes everything. Uh, and so that's just one account, one testimony of, of life-changing uh, decision uh, to abort changing. Uh, another uh, gentleman here, uh, David uh, uh, Bailyman, uh, he's a journalist. Uh, and uh, let's look at his testimony just really quick. He discovered that Planned Parenthood routinely alters the method of performing an abortion in order to obtain the baby's organs, which are then sold for research. In a series of undercover videos, he reported executives from Planned Parenthood specifically acknowledging this. One executive stated, oh, we've been very good at getting heart, lung, and liver because we know that. I'm not gonna crush that part. I'm gonna basically crush below. I'm gonna crush above, and I'm gonna see if I can get it all intact. If abortion is simply removing a clump of cells, as Planned Parenthood uh, suggests, it's weird how clumps of cells magically become intact livers and hearts once it's time for Planned Parenthood to harvest that baby for cash. As one might imagine, Planned Parenthood didn't take a uh, uh, Dillingham's exposure well. They called him an activist, an extremist, claimed he did, uh, deceptively edited the undercover videos. Uh, now the claim has been debunked and waged an all-out assault, legal assault against him that he's going to have to fight uh, in the courts for uh, reporting on all of this. And then you probably, in recent years, you've probably uh, heard of Abby Johnson. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, a movie put out about, about her life. Uh, and I uh, wanted to share just a little bit about, about her if I can. Gabby Johnson is a former director of Planned Parenthood Clinic in Southeast Texas. She had a dramatic change of perspective after viewing an ultrasound image of an abortion in progress. This site uh, led her to quit her job, leave the clinic, and become an active supporter of the pro-life movement. I could see the whole profile of the baby of 13 weeks, head to foot, I could see the baby trying to move away from the probe. She testifies that this experience changed her life forever, and she vowed to never again be a part of something like this. Uh, and her testimony has been uh, put into the movie, and I would encourage you uh, to, to check that out. Uh, abortion is a, is a sick uh, practice, barbaric practice. And, uh, I've, I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, some videos. Uh, and uh, I used to teach biology and all of that, and it's just rather disgusting what the process, uh, the tearing apart, the crushing of the baby, uh, the vacuuming out, sucking out the baby out of the womb, uh, and then they, then, then just a pile of body parts sitting on the table. Uh, and it's just, it's just disturbing uh, to see little hands and feet and eyes uh, not, not placed in the body where they're supposed to be. Which is disgusting. And so, we're to respond with clarity. There is a clear this law. Uh, we know also we're to respond with conviction. With conviction. Uh, do we know what we believe, why we believe it? Proverbs 6, uh, 16, 17, 86 things of the Lord. Hey, 87 are abomination, they go cry over my tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. We got kind of backwards in regards to this. The gospel states this, and Jesus said, Jesus basically said, hey, I will lay down my life for you. And abortionists, it says, and the mother getting the word says, you will lay down your life for me. So we see the backwards. Jesus says, I'll give you my life. Uh, and Moses getting an abortion saying, uh, you will give your life for mine. The question always comes up, though, in regards to abortion. What about... Feel the rest. Well, what about rape and incest? That's always the hey. Well, what about rape and incest? And that's the question that is that is always asked when uh, when these two belief systems collide. Well, what about rape and incest? Let me just say this: rape is a horrible thing, uh, and don't condone that in, in any way, shape, or form. Incest obviously is not is, is a horrible thing uh, as well, uh, but. Note, note this, abortions due to rape and incest are rare uh, and account for only 1% of abortions. So think about 
of babies, uh, moms carrying babies, 22%, and in abortions. 1% of that 22% is due to rape and incest. And so I'm not, I'm not discounting the, uh, the horrible things that people have experienced, but that's, that's just 1%. Uh, the point is this. Who is given the life? God has. God has given the life. And the point is not how a child was conceived. The point is rather that the child was conceived. And the two rights or two wrongs do not make them right. Okay? Two wrongs do not make them right. Uh, this uh, lady here, uh, Kathy, Kathy um, uh, Bar Barnett, she said, uh, just a quick thoughts about her, a couple things that she said. She's a political commentator. Uh, she's a military veteran. Uh, and uh, she describes her life, uh, what she has experienced, and this kind of her testimony of her life. She says this, I am a product of rape. My mother was 12 years old when she delivered me. My father was 21 years old. I had nothing to do with... Uh, uh, do with my genesis or my beginning. I had nothing to do with the conditions under which I was conceived. I had no control over these circumstances that were swirling around me. I had no opportunity to partake in the cumulative decisions that would be made to sustain the pregnancy, yet all the while I was being fearfully and wonderfully woven together in my young mother's womb. My life has value, she continued. I am not an inanimate, inanimate object. I'm a person. Uh, from me, I've given birth to two beautiful, healthy, intelligent, and loving little people who are destined to, gr to grow up into productive members of this great society. I am a veteran. I am a staunch lover of this country. I am a supportive sister, a respectful niece, and a devoted wife. Best of all, I get the wonderful opportunity to now care for my mother. Uh, and what a, what a testimony there. Uh, by, by that, by that lady, uh, Kathy Barnett, and uh, man, this, uh, she was conceived in rape, her mom was 12, and, and her mom uh, chose life, and uh, that's just a, a wonderful thing there. Uh, abortion uh, uh, advocates, they, they often say this, well, that's the last thing, okay, so they often say this, we're almost done here, uh, they say, they promote the idea of safe abortions. They promote that. The reality is there is no such thing. A successful abortion always kills at least one person. Always. The abortion industry is really uh, it's a death industry. Uh, author Randy, Randy Alcorn, he said this, abortion is horrible. Primarily because it is a process in which instruments of death invade a woman's body and kill her innocent child. In, a, in another book, he writes this, I read a newspaper editorial arguing that abortion is just another surgery, no different from a root canal or an appendectomy. But why don't people remember the anniversary of their appendectomy 20 years later? Why don't they find themselves weeping uh, uncontrollably, grieving the loss of their appendix? And where are all the support groups and counseling for those who have had root canals? If it's just a regular procedure. Dr. Patricia Corbin is a uh, professor of human development and family studies at Bollinger State University. Uh, after doing research on 877,000 women, states this. So that's, that's, uh, that's quite a test there, 877,000. 81% of females who had an abortion were found to be at an increased risk for mental health problems, including depression, alcohol abuse, and suicidal behaviors. And you know what? If you look at a lot of the issues that we mentioned, obviously abortion, you look at gender, all, all that kind of stuff, mental, uh, mental health problems always follow uh, because of the confusion that, that goes on. Uh, and here's the, here's the reality. Okay, and I know we're a little late here, but Christians, as Christians, we continue to remain silent. We remain silent uh, because we're afraid of offending others uh, and, and offending their convictions and our, our convictions.
James 4, 17 says, Therefore, the kingdom that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, the kingdom is sin. Genesis 4, verse number 10, And he said, What hast thou done? This is that God speaking to Cain, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto thee from the ground. Hmm. As Christians, uh, we can and must be a voice for the unborn. Proverbs 31, verse 1 8 says, Open thy mouth for the dumb is in the cause of all senses that are appointed to destruction. Psalm 94, 16, Who will raise up for me against evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Who is going to stand for the unborn? And then, let's see, I don't know where that went. I don't know where that went. But let us see, you have one more blank, right? Another way to respond, respond with compassion. Respond with compassion. Okay? Now, consider this. Uh, let me give you really quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, five quick ways in which we can respond, five quick ways in which we can, can help in this area, okay? First one, number one, and I think we do this, we can pray. We can pray. And God knows, God's in control, God's the giver of life. We can pray and thank God. You know, and God answered those prayers uh, as the Supreme Court uh, rejected the Roe versus Wade, which is the word to do. So we can pray. We can speak. Now speak up. Number three. Are we okay? So we can pray. We can speak. Number three. We can foster and adopt. And uh, fostering and adopting is not for everybody, uh, but it's interesting. You can go in and get an abortion. Five hundred dollars, and an adoption costs in the in the tens of thousands sometimes, and you see how backwards that is, uh, and and the fostering uh, as well. Uh, number four, uh, we can educate. We can educate. Hey, people, uh, women, uh, eighty-four percent of women who saw an ultrasound changed their mind, and so uh, what is that? What is that? That's education. Okay. And then number five. And uh, we're blessed here in America to be able to do this. We can vote. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes that voting can get discouraging, uh, but that is, that is a privilege that, that we have to vote. And uh, uh, what I'm, I'm not talking about just voting for, for, uh, for bills, those types of things, for measures and that, but voting for individuals that are in the office. In office. Uh, and people say, I've heard people say this, we shouldn't be one-issue voters. I've heard people say that. But let me tell you something. You support abortion. You don't value life. And so that means my life isn't important to you. And they're not going to get my vote because life isn't important to them. Now, if you, th if you think that they value your life, you got another thing coming. Uh, you look at what's, what's being talked about and what's being argued in our, in our Congress and all of that. Uh, and, and all this to, uh, to promote themselves and to further enslave us, basically. They don't care about us, about themselves. And so we need to vote uh, for people that, that value life. And then, uh, as we come down to the end here, uh, this is a real issue that real people go through, real people have, have, have experienced, they've made mistakes. And so here's the reality of it. And as we look at a world that, that, that is in sin, that makes these mistakes, the best news about all of this is fact that God still forgives. Uh, and that's what our world needs. They need to hear about a forgiving God. You know, we need to, we need to pray. We need to speak up. You know, we need to look at, at ways in which we can help young people uh, that don't have a mom and dad. And we, but we need to educate. Uh, both. And, and we educate uh, yes, showing people what abortion is and how horrible it is. But also that education needs to include that there's many people that are hurting because they've made this decision to terminate the, their child's life. And they need to hear about a God that loves them and is willing to forgive them. Uh, and they need to know that, you know, uh, the decision uh, to abort a baby is wrong, but, uh, you know, that baby is with the Lord. Uh, and, and God will forgive, will forgive them, and they need to, to realize that. But how do they know that God's going to forgive? We don't tell them. We've got to tell them. About who our God is, and that's where we go back to our tone. 
Nobody wants to listen to us. Or nobody will listen to us if we're beaten over the head with it. Okay? And I, and I get, there's a, there might be a time when, uh, when we're called to do that. But what people need to know is they need to see the love of God. Uh, and that they will listen to that and have dialogue and we can educate if we speak that truth in love. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about, our power-ups, all of that, uh, being rooted in love, having a, a heart uh, for others, okay? Uh, let's pray, uh, and then we'll be dismissed here. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you so much for uh, the subject matter tonight. God, I pray that this was... Uh, uh, this, this subject is, can be a little discouraging uh, as we uh, read about and hear about little lives being lost. Uh, and so, God, I pray that you would help us not to, to be discouraged, but help us to, to get up and be willing to fight the good fight, speak the truth in love into, in regards to the sanctity of life. Uh, God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for a mom, for a dad that... For them, it wasn't uh, really a choice that had to be made. But they had a biblical worldview of life, that life is given by God, life is created by God, uh, and uh, uh, we have purpose. And so thank you for that. God, may we be faithful in telling people about your love for them, uh, telling people about the purpose that you have for their life and for the lives of their children. God bless us as we're dismissed now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. Don't forget services on Sunday. Continue to pray for our young people at camp uh, as well. You are dismissed.